Tonight, Penny Wong begins her diplomatic visit to the Middle East. Also, Melissa Hoskins laid to rest at a ceremony in Perth. More Australian families struggling with rising education costs. And Australia's bowlers dominate the West Indies on day one of the Adelaide Test. Good evening, Jessica Harmson with ABC News South Australia. Australia's foreign minister is in Israel making the case for peace as concerns grow that increasing confrontations across the Middle East could draw more countries into full-scale war. Penny Wong expressed solidarity with the families of hostages captured by Hamas on October 7. She also promised more aid as a deal was struck to allow medicine to reach those still held captive in Gaza. Australia's foreign minister visiting the Jewish state and a region in the midst of war to talk with power brokers and to hear from some of those who are suffering, relatives who face the agonising wait for news of their loved ones. Israel says 132 hostages are still being held inside Gaza. It was incredibly moving and, you know, this 102 days has been... Uh, just devastating for them and I'm really grateful for that opportunity. Thank you very much. Penny Wong is now the most senior Australian official to have visited Israel since the October 7 Hamas attacks. She won't be visiting the southern towns where the massacres occurred and the families of hostages want her to see their bullet-ridden homes. I hope that any world leader will come and visit and see it fall in his own eyes because that's something no story can describe. Gaza's health authorities say the massive Israeli response to the Hamas attacks has so far killed 24,200 Palestinians and injured more than 61,000. While Penny Wong says she has raised the issue of a ceasefire in her Israeli meetings, it's unlikely her trip will contain any diplomatic surprises as she navigates growing hostilities from Israeli and Palestinian supporters both in this region and in Australia. Penny Wong's next stop in a whirlwind diplomatic tour will be the West Bank. <laughs> even as war spreads from Gaza's shores to the Red Sea. A US coalition which includes Australia using missile diplomacy against the Houthis in Yemen, including fresh strikes on rebel targets today. The Iranian-backed rebels have been busy intensifying attacks on Red Sea shipping and turning this captured container ship into a mobile military parade ground. We say to our brothers in Palestine, you are not alone, we are here with you until the last drop of our blood. A standoff growing in the gulf between war and peace. Alison Horn, ABC News, Jerusalem. Pakistan has become the third country hit by a strike reportedly from Iran in a few days. It follows Iranian attacks on Iraq and Syria. Tehran is lashing out after a dual suicide bombing. Islamic State group has claimed responsibility. The United States has condemned Iran over its missile strikes on Iraq's northern city of Erbil, causing them, calling them rather reckless and imprecise. Iraq has recalled its ambassador from Tehran. Family, friends and members of the cycling community have gathered to celebrate the life of world champion and Olympian Melissa Hoskins at a funeral in her home city of Perth. The 32-year-old died after being hit by a car outside her home in Adelaide on December 30. A torturous day for family and friends of much-loved champion rider Melissa Hoskins. She was a world champion, she's a dual Olympian and she had time for everyone. During a service in Fremantle, heartbroken family members reflected on the impact that Miss Hoskins, described as a shining light, had had on their lives. Melissa's zest for life and living touched so many people. At school, it would be of no surprise. Sport was her best subject. A two-time Olympian, Hoskins started competitive cycling in her teens. 
She went on to be part of the Australian team that won gold at the World Championships in 2015. A mother of two young children, her life was cut short when she was hit by a car outside her home in Adelaide. Her husband, fellow champion cyclist Rowan Dennis, charged with causing her death by dangerous driving, was present at today's service. We ask you to please join us now in a minute of silence. The tragedy has rocked the cycling community. Competitors paid tribute to the star rider at the recent Tour Down Under women's race in the Adelaide Hills. She's going to be remembered as someone with a massive smile. She's going to be remembered as a world-class athlete. She's going to be remembered as a great friend to many. Not just a track rider, she also excelled on the road before retiring from professional cycling in 2017 at just 26. She was a great team player. Yeah, she was amazing. Yeah, she'll be missed. A memorial service is planned for Adelaide late next month. Claire Moody, ABC News. The cost of putting your kids through school can really add up. New data estimates the price tag for 13 years of public education can exceed $90,000. Disadvantaged families say they're struggling to afford basics like uniforms, shoes and internet access. It's back to school time and for parents, costs are mounting. School shoes, I think they're $50, $60 per Per, per person. Well, I got four kids, so around four or five hundred dollars. For us, it's about a thousand dollars. We found everything from pens to books to basic clothing is increasing daily. New data shows one in four parents are struggling to pay household bills because of back to school costs. The survey by Futurity, which sells education bonds, looked at expenses like uniforms, camps, and computers. It estimated families will spend more than $90,000 putting a child through public school. It's double that at a Catholic school and more than $300,000 at an independent school. The key thing with any school is our staffing costs and predominantly teacher costs. About 70% of the cost of running any independent school will be salaries. And for the most needy, the situation is worse. Often families have to make impossible choices as to how to use their limited funds. Do I pay for those school essentials? Do I pay rent this week? Do I put petrol in the car? A Smith family survey found nearly nine in ten of its parents are worried about back to school costs. More than half fear their kids will miss out on digital devices because of the price. And 45% think they won't afford shoes or uniforms. Most schools will have policies around uh, supporting parents going through some sort of financial hardship. Families can also reach out to charities for help. Alison Branley, ABC News. Beijing is calling for Australia to resume military cooperation and suggested a Japanese warship was responsible for a sonar attack on Australian Navy personnel last year. China's ambassador is also warning the Albanese government against cooperation with Taiwan. Here's defence correspondent Andrew Green. Welcome this SSC. Back from a Beijing break and toasting a new year of diplomatic dialogue with a glass of local red. To the friendship between China and Australia, cheers. cheers. Australian wine still subjected to crippling trade sanctions, which he hopes will soon end. I hope that in the new year, the relations between China and Australia will see sustained, sound and steady development. This year, the ambassador also wants a resumption of defence cooperation. China continues to insist one of its warships did not fire an undersea sonar last year, which injured Australian divers in international waters. Now a startling new claim suggesting Japan may be to blame. A third country boat nearby, whether or not there was sonar from the other side, other party, we're not sure. We made strong representations uh, to China about this incident and we stand by uh, the representations that we made. In the new Chinese Year of the Dragon, the ambassador's signalling a far less fierce approach to Australia. But as always, the topic of Taiwan's causing friction. And in coming days, he's demanding meetings with foreign affairs officials to discuss this country's position.
China's particularly furious at the Albanese government's recent public statements congratulating Taiwan on its presidential elections. We are strongly opposed to such a statement. But he's denied his government offered a bribe to the tiny Pacific nation of Nauru, who this week switched diplomatic allegiances from Taiwan to Beijing. Andrew Green, ABC News, Canberra. Fresh from a win in the Iowa caucuses, Donald Trump has turned his attention to New Hampshire. The landslide victory propels him toward a rematch with US President Joe Biden in November. After his record victory in Iowa, a quick sprint to New Hampshire. A triumphant Donald Trump campaigning in the next state to have its say on who should be the Republican Party's presidential nominee. If you think that it was easy to get here tonight, you are wrong. That was... On the way, Mr. Trump made a quick detour to New York for the start of a second defamation case stemming from E. Jean Carroll's claims he sexually abused her. But Donald Trump has found, and Iowa certainly seems to prove it, that his legal troubles are actually helping his campaign. Good morning! Ron DeSantis finished well behind in Iowa, but it was enough to keep alive the Florida governor's floundering campaign. They threw everything but the kitchen sink at me. Well, guess what? We punched our ticket out of Iowa yesterday. Nikki Haley was squeezed into third, but the former UN ambassador is polling well in New Hampshire. I promise you that our best days are yet to come. After Iowa, there's a real sense here that the race to become GOP nominee is now well and truly on. But that energy might not last long. Unless there's a significant upset, Donald Trump could soon have it all sewn up. Former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson's exit after an embarrassingly bad showing in Iowa won't make a difference. But Vivek Ramaswamy is also out, and his votes could go Trump's way in New Hampshire. Yet another potential boost in his seemingly unstoppable campaign. Barbara Miller, ABC News. Australian technology companies may have to label content generated by artificial intelligence so people can tell it hasn't been made by humans. The federal government has released its initial plans to regulate AI in response to its rapid rise in use online. The government will work with industry to develop a voluntary standard for AI content to carry labels and digital watermarks so other programs can also tell when something is AI made. The industry minister says he'll make content labels mandatory if needed. 51% of all Australians will go through menopause, a natural part of life, but experts say women and gender diverse people still face significant barriers to treatment, including stigma and misinformation. Lauren Roberts explains. There's no build up to it or anything, it's just all of a sudden you feel like you're on fire. 64-year-old Corrine Pullman struggled with unpleasant perimenopausal symptoms for more than a decade before starting medication. It's just really an intense feeling of heat. And she's not the only person struggling during this phase. About 26% of women aged 45 to 64 had symptoms that were making it hard to do daily activities. The typical Australian woman reaches menopause at 51 and may experience weight gain, irregular periods, joint pain, difficulty sleeping, tiredness, mood swings, an overactive bladder and vaginal dryness. Experts say more needs to be done to break down stigma surrounding menopause. I think we need to celebrate the fact that when we get to menopause, we're incredibly wise, we know so much, and we've got a third of our lives to really live um, a great life in rather than considering menopause as the end of everything. Dr Karen McGraith sees patients going through this phase and wants more education for GPs across Australia. I'd like to see improved education of health professionals at undergraduate level uh, and at postgraduate level um, and I'd like to see more emphasis on menopause in, in GP training. To minimise symptoms, she recommends that women eat a diet rich with leafy green veggies and calcium 
quit smoking, cut down on alcohol and exercise regularly. Experts say misinformation and predatory marketing on social media still persist, but there are many proven ways to treat symptoms. It's really important not to, um, I guess, be distracted by these things that are being presented on social media. Go and talk to your doctor and look for things that have an evidence base. A time of change which experts say we need to talk more about. Lauren Roberts, ABC News, Darwin. In an Australian first, a vaccine for RSV has been approved by the Therapeutic Goods Administration and will soon be available to those aged over 60. The GlaxoSmithKline vaccine, called Arexv, is a protein-based immunisation to help prevent the lower respiratory tract disease caused by RSV. Lisa Loder never believed looking after her grandchildren would make her fearful for her life until she contracted RSV. I honestly thought I was going to die. It was terrible. She caught the virus off her three-year-old grandson in 2022. It rapidly progressed into a serious case of pneumonia, which took months to recover from. A year and a half later, she still experiences shortness of breath. I actually had my voice box paralysed as well, so for seven weeks I had no voice. Now, the Therapeutic Goods Administration has approved a vaccine for RSV. Initially, it'll only be available by a private prescription to those 60 and over. The vaccine, called Arexv, works to boost patients' immune response to the virus. It is very effective. It has well over 80% effectiveness against serious illness and death. Experts hope it'll reduce hospitalisations and comorbidities such as asthma. There's an association with RSV and asthma, so we think we might actually prevent asthma by stopping people getting RSV, but eventually we can decrease the amount of asthma we see. The producers hope the vaccine will eventually be made available for free under the National Immunisation Program and to other vulnerable groups including pregnant women and those who are immunocompromised. For people like Lisa, it's a great relief. She says she'll be getting vaccinated as soon as possible. You just never know how bad you're going to get it. You might get a mild dose and you might end up like I did and really scared and really sick. Pharmaceutical company GlaxoSmithKline says it's working to secure supply and says the jabs will be available soon. Amelia Walters, ABC News. The bus driver on the night of last year's Hunter Valley wedding tragedy has been formally charged with 26 new offences, including 10 counts of manslaughter. It brings a total number of charges laid against Brett Andrew Button to 89. Ten guests died after a wedding when their bus crashed near the New South Wales town of Greta in June. The 58-year-old driver didn't appear in Newcastle local court this morning. The magistrate continued his bail conditions, which include a curfew and a ban on driving. Mr Button's due to appear in court in March. It's been revealed a Sydney man who police say was behind an SMS scam is accused of sending more than 17 million messages in just a week. He appeared in court today and was also charged with using passport and driver's licence information. Most people have received them. Some fall for them. SMS phishing aims to collect personal or banking information through sham links sent by text designed to look like it's from a legitimate company. And this is what police allege is behind the scenes. A New South Wales cybercrime strike force investigated an alleged phishing scam and in mid-December they found two of these devices, SIM boxes, at a home in Moorbank. Juan Su is the man police claim sent more than 17 million scam text messages before he was arrested. Many were designed to look like they were from Australia Post and toll company linked. According to court documents, they were sent in just a week. Today, the 39-year-old faced Liverpool local court. Mr Su, did you send those scam text messages? No plea has been entered. I need to take further instructions before I can advise my client any further. Mr Sue was already facing a charge of using equipment connected to a network to commit a serious offence. Today in court it was revealed he's also been charged with dealing with identity information, which has a maximum penalty of 10 years in prison. According to court documents, the second charge relates to the alleged use of passport and driver's licence information with the intention of committing or facilitating fraud. It's alleged that occurred between September 2022 and the arrest. Can you stop my baby? Mr Sue remains on bail and his case returns to court in April. Jamie McKinnell, ABC News, Sydney. Coming up on 7.30 with Laura Tingle, the risky business of volcano tourism in Indonesia. 
it's not every day you can see a live active volcano. The risk of an eruption um, in an active volcano is never going to be zero. <laughs> Udah bang, karena setiap perjalanan kayak setiap kemana aja kita pasti risikonya berbahaya, apalagi itu gunung aktif kan bang. Also, I'll speak to the Minister for Science, Ed Husik, about artificial intelligence. To finance now, and China's population has shrunk for the second year in a row. Here's David Chow. Our biggest trading partner has given an update on how its economy is going, and it's a mixed bag. China's economy grew by 5.2% in the year to December, and while this meets the Chinese government's growth target, surprise, surprise, it's one of China's weakest economic updates in decades, apart from that huge downturn during the COVID years, which was then followed by a hefty, prolonged slump in its property market. Now, China's future isn't looking very young or sprightly. Although China scrapped its one-child policy years ago, its population is shrinking rapidly. Last year, 11 million people died in China, while only 9 million babies were born. This ageing population isn't great for China's economy, and it's not great for ours either. Meanwhile, it was another bad day for the All Lords, which slipped by a third of 1% to its lowest level in a month. Evolution mining plunged by more than 17% after it gave a weak trading update, and other mining stocks also fell. This comes after a sizeable drop in gold and oil prices, while iron ore bounced back a little from its recent sell-off. And it's been pretty rough for the Aussie dollar, which in two weeks has dropped from 68 to 65.6 US cents. And it's mainly because the US greenback has gotten stronger, after a senior official from the US Federal Reserve told markets to basically get real and not expect rapid interest rate cuts this year. And finally, with the exception of Japan, it was pretty much red wherever you looked in global markets, with Hong Kong being the worst performer. And that's finance. West Indies debutant Shamar Joseph has had a dream start to his test career, removing Steve Smith cheaply in his first match as an Australian opening batter. Earlier, Pat Cummins and Josh Hazelwood took four wickets each as Australia bowled out the West Indies for 188 on day one of the first test at Adelaide Oval. Steve Smith was made to wait in his first match as opening batsman. Pat Cummins surprisingly sending the visitors in to bat. That decision paid off, the captain finding a breakthrough in his very first over. Slowly for Laura taken. Cameron Green, that's why he's there. The skipper struck again in the first hour before Josh Hazelwood's 250th test wicket put the home side well on top. The West Indies dug in after lunch, debutante Kavem Hodge showing patience. His innings came to an abrupt end on 12, as Hazelwood picked up another. Go on, just like that. Kirk McKenzie scored his first half century in Test cricket before falling the very next over. Hazelwood is having a day out here in Adelaide. Hazelwood and Cummins with four wickets each before a late surge frustrated Australia's attack. Debutante Shamar Joseph and Kemar Roach putting on a 55-run partnership for the final wicket. Oh, that's close. That's really close. It's been given. Steve Smith entered the field for his first bat as an opener, but Joseph's dream start continued, removing the veteran with his very first delivery. Beautifully done. First ball, first wicket. What a start. Manus Labashain the next to go. Joseph with two key wickets for the visitors. And possibly could be involved. Australia two down, but still on top, ahead of day two. Cameron Slesser, ABC News. A 16-year-old is the first player into the Australian Open's third round, with Russia's Miran Andreeva producing one of the tournament's major upsets. Australian qualifier Storm Hunter is also through, along with Alex Dimonor. As the rain arrived at Melbourne Park, the demon shone under the bright lights of Rod Laver. Oh, that's beautiful. The world number 10 steamrolling Italian Matteo Arnoldi, dropping just six games. And it's a demolition by the demon. I thought I just had to be solid here, use the crowd, uh, try to stay focused, and uh, I'm very happy to, to get the win today. 
A second Aussie soon joined him in the third round, the world's top-ranked doubles player who had to qualify for the main draw. Hunter storms into the third round. This doesn't happen every day, so um, I'm super excited and enjoy it with you guys. Um, I love playing in front of you. Earlier, a star was born, Russian teenager Mira Andreeva, stunning six seed Ons Jabur in 54 minutes. And that will do it. What a performance from the 16-year-old has defeated her idol in straight sets. It's Six her five, first six, top two. 10 win and her first match back on Rod Laver since finishing as runner-up in last year's Junior Girls Oz Open final. I just feel like I am a bit more mature than I was before. I just... Uh... You're only 16. <laughs> well, that's true, but... <laughs> Um, last year I was 15 and so... <laughs> last night Isla Tomjanovic staged a fight back for the ages. There's the break. Down 4-1 and a double break to Croatian Petra Marcic. She rallied, reeling off five straight games to win the marathon standoff in just under three hours. Twelve months ago the 30-year-old went under the knife for a knee injury. Tonight was just a huge kind of reward that feels amazing because you you don't know every time when you're coming back from surgery if you'll come back. It's it's a gamble in a way. Jessica Stewart, ABC News. Mexican rider Isaac del Toro Romero has stunned his more fancied rivals to win the second stage of the Tour Down Under. His first professional victory was enough to help him take the overall leader's jersey as the race heads to the halfway mark. Riders welcome much cooler conditions on stage two, winding out of Adelaide's eastern suburbs back into the Adelaide Hills. It didn't take long for a breakaway, Luke Burns and Yadi Vanderley going it alone. The peloton was initially content to leave them be. Have you seen the time gap? Six minutes for, I can't believe it. Allowing the Dutchman Vanderley to grab sprint time bonuses. However, it was Burns who took enough points to claim the king of the mountain lead. 100 metres, a good decision. Yes, he's done it. It's tough breaking early from the peloton, and as the race worked its way up some steep hills, the lead was whittled down, the time gap halved with a long way to go. Eventually, they were caught. With 20 kilometres left to ride, the peloton is a grouper all together. It was anybody's race before Mexican Isaac del Toro Romero pushed hard to set up a dash for victory. He couldn't be reeled in. Oh, he's done it! Right on the line! It's an emotion, you know. Ah, the last year was crazy, but this one, maybe I start really good. I don't know. I don't know what I want to say. It's so... Ah, it's so much. A breakthrough first professional win for the 20-year-old. The victory was enough to give him the leader's ochre jersey. Tomorrow's third stage is a longer 145-kilometre trek from Tea Tree Gully to Campbelltown. Matthew Smith, ABC News. On to the weather now, but first a look at tonight's photo of sunrise over Mount Lofty sent to us by Keith Miller. It was mild and partly cloudy across Adelaide today. It reached 21.2 in the city after an overnight low of 14.2. Further afield, a trough moved across the east today, causing temperatures to fall across the board, apart from in the far north. It was 23 in Wyala and 21 in Kingscoat. Cloud over the tropics with a monsoon trough and lows causing persistent heavy rain and thunderstorms while cloud over WA, the NT, Queensland's interior and New South Wales will also trigger some intense showers and storms and a trough and low over Victoria and Tassie should bring some rain. Hot sunny and 37 degrees for the Alice tomorrow, a possible shower and up to 30 in Sydney, 21 in Melbourne and 28 for Perth. Back home it'll be warm and sunny right across the north tomorrow with tops of 30 degrees in Woomera and 28 in Port Pirie. Further south, isolated showers will continue about southern coasts and ranges and it'll reach 26 degrees in Maitland and 21 in Coonawarra. A strong wind warning remains for the lower southeast coast. Cloud will begin to clear over Adelaide tomorrow, but it'll remain mild and mostly cloudy. We're heading for a top of 24 in the city after an overnight low of 13. On the waters, south to southwesterly winds to 20 knots and seas to one and a half metres. The sun will rise around 20 past six and set about half past eight. 
And looking a bit further ahead, it'll be mostly sunny with a top of 28 degrees on Friday, up to 34 degrees forecast on Saturday, 33 Monday, 38 Tuesday and 29 with a possible shower this time next week. And that's the latest from the Adelaide Newsroom. Thanks very much for your company. Stay with us. Laura Tingle's up next with 7.30.